It's being recorded. Well, hello everybody, welcome to Friday. Um, I'm on my iPad and it's a, it's a pretty small screen. So I'm gonna ask if Anna, Gabriel, um, Giovanni, uh, Letiza will uh, send any messages from Facebook over to Zoom. If you're on, on Zoom, you'll be able to talk with our artist, Tiffany Mang, today directly. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I'm so excited to be a part of this live Zoom uh, and meet John Cogley and the rest of the team. And it's a true honor to be able to talk about the Daniel Smith extra fine gouaches. So I'm really excited about that. Kevin, I didn't ask you, is it all right if people ask you questions as you paint or do you want the questions at the end? Um, yeah, people can ask me. I, I probably won't be checking, but if someone could just ask them to me, I have no problem like answering okay. it while I paint. Excellent. I might like stutter a little bit sometimes. I can't paint and talk at the same time very good, but I can answer them for sure. Fantastic. Um, so we're going to start with a um, uh, Stephen is seeing the photos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Ethel, can you do that, please? Yeah. Stephanie, whenever you're ready to uh, share a slide. Oh, yes. Okay, I can do that. Um, oh, hold on. Give me one sec. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Can you guys all see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to share uh, just some a few gouache pieces that I've done along the years. I started gouache around 2013, I think, around, um, I think, the junior year of college, which totally dates me. Um, I'm 31. <laughs> um, and yeah, when I, I first fell in love with gouache, because it was such an easy, portable medium to take out uh, into plain air. And I never planned air until plain air painted until college. And when I, once I did, I just totally fell in love. So I have um, just a few pieces from Europe. Um, I did live in Poland for a couple of, or maybe like a year total uh, working on the film Loving Vincent. And during that time, uh, Loving Vincent is the world's first fully oil painted feature film about Vincent van Gogh. Sorry for those of you guys who didn't know. Um, and so these are some of the um, gouache paintings that I did. Oh, I hope I can, they're not in order. Um, some gouache paintings that I did, hold on, uh, let me just, Show the thumbnails. Uh, I guess they're not completely in order, but that one's from Spain. This one is um, another one from Poland. And as you can see, when I worked in gouache, which might be something different, that I really like to pile on the texture quite a lot. So this one, for example, is done on just cold pressed watercolor paper. I either like to paint on cold pressed watercolor paper or illustration board, and I cut up my own boards. And I can show some examples later on. In the demo, I will be doing watercolor paper just because I have um, a pad of paper. Uh, and in case the painting doesn't turn out great, it's just like something great to practice on. Um, but yeah, I love to use, I love gouache for its opaqueness. Um, I don't use a lot of transparency. Um, and you can see sometimes I'll paint thinner in some places. This was a plein air I did recently in Lone Pine Lake. And um, yeah, I just love to use some of those colors from Daniel Smith, like here I was using the lavender and some of the wisteria. So um, those are really fun colors to use to pop in those shadow areas. Um, and yeah, here's some paintings I did recently in La Papa Invitational last year in October. And um, yeah, I just, my, my focus is landscapes. I love landscapes and um, I just love capturing different, uh, I love to be able to figure out how to push colors in the shadow areas and really just try to capture the essence of the landscape in front of me uh, and that impression that it, it first lay, it first made on me when I first laid eyes on the site. So this is one of my more recent pieces where I was uh, really playing around with Daniel Smith gouache. So I used a lot of buff titanium and lavender and wisteria, which are three of my favorite colors in the Daniel Smith gouache line that 
I have never used before. And so it was like, it opened up a whole new world for me because usually I stick with more primary colors. Um, and so this was a fun piece to, to do that was also inspired by Lone Pine Lake. Oh, sorry, Mount Whitney. This is Mount Whitney, which is close, which is the hiking trail I, I went on to get to Lone Pine Lake. Um, here is another one from Europe. Uh, this was a six by six gouache painting. And um, yeah, you can see again how I can paint quite thick and uh, this technique I like to use, which is the marbleization technique, which is loading a lot of pigment onto your brush, which I can demo later. And uh, really just when you put on the paint on canvas, it allows you to get streaks of different color all at the same time. And so I kind of coined that technique marbleization. It's not official or anything. Um, this is one of my most recent pieces as well, inspired by Australia, where, where I taught a workshop recently last year in September. And so um, this was part of a show they had. And you can see the techniques I'm using here as well on the bottom left. Sorry, am I going way too technical right now, John? I, I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I tend to like start to talk really micro. So let me know if it's too, too specific. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a really fun piece to do as well. Um, and you can see here, what I really like to do is be able to uh, pop saturation in, in, in areas that you wouldn't might like, think to do. So for example, in the shadow area, I used a brighter pink and some turquoise. Uh, and this is actually something I learned studying from Nikolai Fetchin's paintings. He's one of my favorite artists that I, always look to you for inspiration. And um, yeah, I think that's all the paintings that I had pulled up. Um, yeah, if there's anything you want me to talk about more, let me know, John. Oh, well, this would be one. Good if you shared your contacts, like your Instagram, Facebook, website. Oh, yes. Um, I can, we have a slide, we have a different slide for that, Tiffany, if you want us to share. Oh yeah, if, if you could share that because I don't know why it's not letting me pull it up right now. So I'll stop share. Okay. Um, of course, Tiffany is in Facebook and Instagram and has a beautiful website. Let me share screen. I will say I'm not very active on Facebook. <laughs> I just share everything from my Instagram onto my Facebook because I'm actually very lazy with social media. Um, so. If I could choose not to be on social media, <laughs> I, I I like to post, but it's at the same time, it's like you really have to keep, you know, on top of all that. But Instagram would be my main. Um, I would say if you have any questions, you can message me on Instagram. I'm pretty active on Instagram um, and email as well. So if you have any questions about anything, you can feel free to kindly send me an email at tiffanymangart at gmail.com. And um, my website is yeah, that's my Instagram. That's my website. Oh, thank you for making me. This is so nice. <laughs> um, I just have like a really boring slide of all my contacts. Um, yeah, that's my Instagram. Sure that you all uh, get the handle. It's Tiffany Mang Art. That's Instagram. Yes, yes. So I tried to make it easy. My email is also Tiffany Mang Art at gmail.com. My Instagram is Tiffany Mang Art. And then my website is just Tiffany Mang, my name. And it's IE, so and make sure you spell my name with the IE because then it won't work. So <laughs> my name is a uh, is my my parents made it tricky. So yeah, um, so yeah, that's that's my main socials. If you guys wanna reach out or anything, feel free to. Oh, I think you're muted, John. There we go. Uh, now it should work. All right, so um, Tiffany has, um, you can ask Tiffany questions as she paints. She'll um, try to answer them. Uh, if you're on Facebook, somebody will relay your message across. Tiffany, I wanna give you as much time as possible. Your work is beautiful. Love to, to see the demo. Awesome, um, let me just take a second. You can, um, let me switch to my camera. So it's gonna take me a hot second to make sure. Everything's on. Um, okay. You guys can still all hear me, right? 
um, static picture of you. Okay, give me one second. I to turn off my fake background. Did it work? It worked. Yeah, it worked. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Hold on, let me get this straight and the lighting a little bit more better. That was not proper grammar. Okay. Later. Not too cool. Okay. Okay. Um, let me. Tiffany, uh, Bell uh, is asking if you use a palette knife at all in your paintings. Um, you know, I for oil I do, but not for gouache, just because it would use up a ton of paint, and and I already use a ton of paint. Uh, I have done palette knife once when I actually forgot to bring my brushes out to plain air, and I was like, well, I have a palette knife, so I'm just going to improvise. Um. But I, I haven't. So I think that I could safely say that's the one time I've used a palette knife. But I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't try. You can definitely, I think gouache is thick enough that you could probably get some pretty cool textures. I can almost mimic like a palette knife texture feel with this flat brush that I have. So the brushes that I mainly use is this one inch flat brush. And this, I don't even know, this is like, um, like a kind of a beat up round brush. And then I recently started using this um, tiny little flat brush that I have that's actually great for getting smaller details. So those are the brushes and um, I use that for you know anything from, these are like, I think three by six paintings. So these are some recent planar paintings that I did. Um, and I will use the flat brush for like, no matter how small. And I actually, I had a slide that showed my minis, but I guess that didn't pull up, but I actually paint also all of my two inch by two inch paintings. Um, I have a book out about that right now that showcases 100 of my two inch by two inch gouache paintings. And I still use the one inch brush for all those paintings because it's just such a great way to practice simplification and grouping and just capturing really gestural color notes. So these are the brushes that I use. Um, I'm gonna put them aside. And then for palette, I have a sponge right here and I use a Star Wet Masterson palette and I'll just use a like a really nice mister. I got this at, I think you can get this on Amazon or any art store. Um, I think you can get this on Amazon or any art store. Oh, was there just feedback just now? No, that's okay now. Oh, okay, okay. I was like, who's that? Um, yeah, so I'll just spray that a little bit. I just cleaned my palette so you guys can actually see my colors. Other than that, I'll show you the actual palette that I've been working off of, which is a horrendous mess. So this is what I'll usually work off of, but for the sake of like you being able to see my color, <laughs> um, I, I have two palettes. So this is actually, I will say though, when I am maybe halfway through my gouache paintings, um, I actually like to work off of something messy like this because I can almost like dry brush and kind of like barely pick up color and really get subtle color temperature shifts that way versus when I start off on a really clean palette, it's almost too clean for me. And I get, I don't know, it's a really weird thing to explain, but um, those are my two stages of palettes that you can see. Um, yeah, so this is a smaller size. I guess I can look at the chats right now. This is a smaller size I have. There is a bigger size that I have as well that I actually never hardly ever use. Um, and I bring this out for plain air and in the studio as well if I'm not working on a super big painting. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, was there something else I wanted to talk about? I'm gonna go ahead and start squeezing my colors. I'm a little bit worried I might run out of white, so hopefully I won't. <laughs> um, I usually use like huge tubes of white. Um, I used to use an acrylic, for those of you who have used Saw Wet Masterson, I used to use in uh... mm. Oh no. I think she has a poor connection. Oh, awesome. Let me chat with her. 
Ethel, did we uh, have part on the I'm, slide about her book? Um, in Facebook, I just pasted it. I'm, I'm about, about to put it in chat and in Zoom. Thank you. I'm I'm back right now. Can you guys hear me? Are there? I hear you. <laughs> can you see me? Air. Okay. Now we can. Okay. Yeah, I like conked out. I was like, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, I know what I want to talk about. Okay, so for those of you guys wondering, like, what my go-to palette is, I got a couple questions on Instagram, like, what would be your go-to palette for um for for plain air would be? Usually for plain air, you definitely have to have white, and I probably have Hansa. I use kind of a, I use a lot of yellows actually. I think those are the most yellows that I use, um, and I use Hansa Yellow Light, uh, Pyrol Red. You can have burnt sand. Is it clear? Wait, let me just sharpen this a little bit. Uh, okay, that's... is that clear? Um, you can have burnt sienna, although you can mix burnt sienna from the primary color. So I this would be like my stripped down palette. Like if I really, really wanted to go minimalistic, and if I wanted to expand, I really do like a warmer yellow. So I do like um, Hansa Yellow Deep for my warmer yellow. Yellow ochre, I actually must say, like I will bring this with me everywhere because I like to tone my canvas with yellow ochre. I always tone my canvas with yellow ochre. Um, you don't have to always tone yellow ochre. You can tone with a cooler yellow or crazy colors like a blue or something if you're doing a nocturne. Um, but this is, this is pretty much a nice staple as well. And then if I wanted to really have fun in the studio, I would bring these two colors out. Um, and these colors, the green, I know I can mix green from, you know, a mixture of these, but I actually really like using a bright green sometimes. And some, and when I mix that with red, I get really cool gray combinations. So this is a green that I really like. Um, and cascade green is a nice earthy color as well. Oh, sorry, earthy green as well. So these would be like sort of my extended palette. Um, burnt sienna is another really great earth tone to have. But again, you can actually mix them from these colors. So if I really want to strip down, maybe I don't need to bring that. But I hope that answers some people's questions of, uh, you know, what I would bring out, out in plain air. And because in plain air, I don't want to be I don't want to be like fumbling for colors. It's it's kind of it's one thing that you know takes up time, and sometimes I just want to be able to squeeze, and so um, that's why I like to strip down. So I'm gonna move it over. And ultramarine blue, yes. I, sorry if I forgot to say that. That would be my blue color. So I have a yellow, a red, and an ultramarine blue. I like ultramarine over cobalt. I don't know why. <laughs> I just, I think, I think it's just a habit, a choice of habit. So um, let's see the Hansa, I'm going to go with Hansa yellow deep and I might not use all these colors, but I'm just going to squeeze them right now just to show you guys. That's Hansa yellow deep. And then this is very organized for me, squeezing my colors. Usually I have them in like not a great order. I just squeeze them in random order. So this is a very organized for me. <laughs> um let's see I'm gonna go with I'm gonna actually squeeze oh you know I will need green for what I'm painting so I'm gonna squeeze a cascade green and then I probably will need a lot more paint than this so I'm going to probably be squeezing along the way as I do I use a lot of paint for gouache and so my friends are like, green wow. again. Yeah, that's cascade green. This is oh sorry. So I should say this is lavender and this is wisteria. So this is wisteria and this is lavender. And I really like using them for shadows. Um, and I'm gonna be painting a snow scene today. So let's see how far I get. But um I'm gonna go ahead and squeeze a Indian and maybe a quinac or no. I'm gonna go ahead and squeeze quinac for don. I pronounce that just right there. Sort of a 
purplish tone um, to counter the more bright pyrrole red. So uh, you can't see, I guess you can't see my reference, but basically it's going to be a very simple uh, mountain scene. Um, there's some, I might stand for this actually, hold on guys. I paint standing, so it's easier for me to see. Oh, hold on. I hope my camera doesn't die. So many moving parts. Okay, so, so I start off with a quick sketch. In this case, I'm doing it with pencil. Although sometimes, and actually I might just do this for the sake of letting you see it more, I'll sketch with a red pen. This is just like a felt pen you can get anywhere. And I like to sketch with a warm pen because it, um, when it bleeds, which it will, because when you put water on it, it, it bleeds like a nice warm tone and it doesn't, it doesn't, um, conflict with with, uh, with the colors I'll put on, hopefully. Like if I were to paint with a Sharpie or sketch with a Sharpie, which I don't recommend, it's just going to look, you're gonna have to spend more time covering all those awful Sharpie sketches that you that you made. So I, I've done that before. I'm like, oh God, it's just like spend half the time trying to cover all those marks I did with the Sharpie, especially if you have like, a ton of sketchy lines like I'm doing right now, you know? So this, these are trees because you probably cannot see when I'm sketching at all because I'm very loose. <laughs> um, and basically there's like a mountain in the back. And uh, let's see, there's some light shapes here. And I'm just getting a quick sense of the competition. Co composition. These are rocks in the foreground and I'm, and I'm just thinking of a, let me hold it closer. Um, yeah, let me see if I can send the reference photo in the chat really quick. Uh, let's see, file, my computer. So I'm gonna send the reference photo. So you guys can all see what I'm painting. I hope you guys all can see that. Now the trickiest part I think for me is going to be really organizing the trees and um, really thinking about how to lead your eye into the competition. Comp Why do I keep saying that? Composition. Uh, and and um, really trying to, I think for me making, the, can you guys all see the reference photo? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So. Yeah. Yeah, rocks is like, I like to say rocks is not my strong point. So I don't really know why. <laughs> I just like the colors and I thought it'd be a great way, but it'll be interesting. So I like to first dip my brush in yellow ochre and I'm just gonna do a light wash over the whole, whole painting. So this is a six by eight. You can see, yeah. Uh, Rafael uh, is asking whether you would uh, also paint on tonalized or even black support. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. I've never done it before, but you could definitely try uh, a tonal, you mean like a toned board? Yeah, something that has, uh, that is colored, that is not totally white. Uh, yeah, I totally would. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm actually going to start over because I didn't realize that wasn't tape. Sorry. I'm going to start over really quick. That's going to be really annoying. And it's going to bend. Um, yes, I yeah, I think you can definitely try that. So um, I've never painted on blackboard before, but you can you can try it out and let me know. I usually just tone like what I just showed you. I'll tone my canvas like so and then paint on top of it. And I'll actually start working thick pretty quickly. So um, I have a feeling if I don't do my sketch well, this whole painting is going to turn out to be a disaster. But please, what are you drawing me. with? Um, I'm drawing with a, um, it's a Stedler tripless fine liner in red. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you can get any, um, like any felt marker. I like this. I like this because it's thin. Um, but you can just don't, I would not, I would say don't paint with a Sharpie because that will definitely ruin your painting unless you're a very clean sketcher. All right, let's 
Okay. If any, while putting the gouache color in your palette, before that, what is that yellow? Is it a yellow patch? Is it a sponge or a cloth? It's a sponge, yeah. Right. It's a sponge and I just wet it. Um, and so right now, it's, it, I don't like it too moist because I do not like my colors to be super runny. Um, so you. it's like relatively moist and I use this um, spray bottle. This just helps it to be like, um, it gives a really nice fine mist. So it, it won't oversaturate your sponge too much. Oh my God, why is all my paper warping? This is really annoying. Okay, I guess it was pointless to start over. I'm gonna have to hold this down. So after I tone it, I like to dab it just a little bit with the towel. I use paper, I use cloth towels that I will rewash, um, but I also have paper towels handy as well. And the downfall you can see is, I don't know why this is all um, coming off, but the downside with, I guess, watercolor paper, sometimes it can warp and I should have, I should have just um, taped it, but I thought it was on a block. I'm gonna go ahead and start with my uh, shadow shapes because I tend, I think if I block in the rocks, it will carve out the snow. And I think I'm gonna work on that bottom part and work on my way up, but I don't always work from like foreground to background or background to foreground. And I usually work from the darkest shapes, the lightest shapes first. So in this case, what is really catching my eye, and I will say actually for the reference photo, I did digitally paint over it slightly. The original reference, I added those light patches um, in the kind of the middle ground, just to create a little bit more contrast there. So, you can see right away, I'm painting, I'm gonna be painting pretty thick. Um, it's just the way my brain works. I can't start from thin. So I'm gonna see just how, so right now you can see it's already kind of giving some nice dry brushing and that's all through the, the water, the water uh, amount on my brush. So I like to say that gouache you can control and I'm using my one inch flat brush right now. Sorry guys for this warping. Um, and I can, I love to use like all corners of it. So I like to, I can really get a lot of great block in through all corners of my one inch brush. And so a lot of the times I don't need a lot of different brushes because I can kind of find the versatility in that one brush. So it's Tiffany, gonna look like no. yellow yeah. ochre. Is that yellow ochre that you use to tone your paper? Yes, yellow ochre, yeah. Okay, thank you. Is that is, is the same one that you use for the mixes, right? Um that you're using yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yellow ochre right here. Yeah. So a technique that, yeah, of course, a technique that you can do with gouache that I don't think you can do with watercolor, though, correct me, is that um, if I cut into my snow shape, oh my gosh, I really don't know what I'm doing right now. <laughs> this is that the nerves of painting live. Sorry, guys. Um, I can, I know I can cut into my, um, my rock shapes with my snow shape. So so that's what I like about like the, the concept of kind of like cutting in and out and uh, with my shapes and gouache. And that's part of the reason why I, I can, I like to paint a little bit thicker so I can cover up my mistakes. So I'm using lavender and wisteria right now. And I think those would just be really, really great for uh, the shadow shapes and then to not make it so saturated, the shadow shapes, I'm mixing a little bit of yellow ochre in to uh, desaturate those blues a little bit so that you get those nice grayer tones in the rocks. So let's see, almost like figuring out how, and I can either even dry brush right here. And I know there's gonna be some light patches, but I'm just going to, I just want to cover more area right now so I can really see the abstract pattern that I'm making with my light and dark shape. So since I toned my canvas already, I, I have essentially my lighter tones and nothing's really white. No, there's nothing really white in, in nature. 
So even if something seems white, I never put on straight white, which is why I like buff titanium so much because it just gives you that really nice kind of in between. And I actually really like to use it as a neutralizer. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and really, really quickly, I tend to paint really slow when I'm talking, sorry. Uh, just to block in some of these, I'm just gonna try to be more rough with it. So I'm using Cascade Green right now and um, Yellow Ochre. You can see I've already used up a lot of my Yellow Ochre already. So I'm just going to, I'm gonna have to squeeze more Yellow Ochre. I might just use the whole tube. Um, here. Be just generous I, with your paint. Yeah. I appreciate what you mentioned about using white to neutralize colors. I've uh, often tried to have this conversation and I appreciate hearing you talk about that. That yeah, one of its no. main functions is to desaturate or neutralize. Oh yes, white is, people think, you know, white, you know, I like to say white um, desatur always desat it lightens, but it desaturates, right? You're never gonna mix white and have it be like a super neon pink. Like, so a lot of times when people are, are struggling to get that, um, that, you know, saturation, they think by lighter and lighter by mixing white, you're actually desaturating it. So you either have to, you know, start with a color fresh out of the tube. Like if I started with pyrrole and then I kept mixing white into it, it would just desaturate the color more and more as well as lightening it. So I, yeah, I, and you, and you, they say you need to use a lot of white and gouache because it, it darkens. Uh, gouache tends to darken more, which is the, uh, I guess the learning curve that a lot of people have to go through and that can be frustrating, but I will say Daniel Smith washes. I haven't had that problem as compared to other gouaches. So it's been actually really nice to not have to go back and, you know, fix values and stuff because values is the crux of everything. So is the crux of a good painting. So I'm squinting at my reference photo right now. I should probably block in, I need, I'm gonna need a lot of this paint. Uh, Tiffany, how much cleaning of your brush do you do as you go along? Uh, I'm constantly cleaning, um, like in between when I mix colors, like especially when I know I'm going to mix like a really pure light color, I definitely want to make sure my brush is clean. But, and I'll change my water maybe every, I don't know, 30 minutes or something. Um, but it's not like an excessive amount of, of cleaning. So uh, like right now for the snow, let's see, I have this. I think I'm actually, I might need cobalt to get a slightly, oh, you know what? I'm gonna use a little bit of permanent green to get just a slightly cooler tinge in some parts of the snow. So I'm just mixing a little bit of permanent green into the, uh, sorry, the lavender. And I'm just going to put it on a little bit saturated. And I'm actually going to put a little bit more. This is why I don't like mixing on a clean sponge because I feel like I can't get body. It's a, it's the same. It's like I can pile on my paint um, a little bit more easier with like a really destroyed palette, I guess I like to say. Um, now, the one thing I will say that might be really easy to do is really make the, uh, the snow too saturated, which is, which is what I think I'm doing right now. So to desaturate that, maybe I'll, I'll just put a little bit of buff titanium. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll try that out. Um, Cause I really, I really like to get those subtle. You can see how I'm trying to use all the angles of my brush. And at the same time, what I'm probably going to do, yeah, it looks way too dark on Zoom right now, but I also think it's because my rocks need to be darker. So it's either fixing the values in the rocks or in the snow, one or the other, um, and just sort of finding that perfect medium. Now, what I could do if I was really good at planning out my whites was like leave areas of this right here where, this, where the sun will shine through. But what I'll probably end up doing is like dry brushing over some of these areas to really get that peak of light shining through. Um, so mixing a little bit of white and then a little bit of buff titanium, maybe. I think wisteria will actually be a little bit too warm for the snow. So 
It's just about experimenting. Maybe the, the other reason why I like painting on a palette where all my colors I've been mixing is I, I take from a lot of colors uh, from my previous mixing palette. Uh, so like, for example, here, I could take some of that and bring it into, this is my tree color and I can bring it into the, um, this looks like water right now. I need to somehow fix that. Uh, bring it into my snow color. And so I'm borrowing colors and I think I'm mixing too much water. This is why I can't be a watercolor is because like I mix water and I'm really like, oh, it's too watery. I'm just kidding. I admire all you watercolorists out there. I'm trying to think, maybe I'll try a little bit of quinacrinone magenta just to start putting some slight subtle variations and right away what I know is that I need to uh, definitely need to do another pass on my rocks. And in the background here, actually, I'm just gonna do the rocks really quick because the values are quite bothering me. So let's see, with the rocks, I'm gonna take a bunch of ultramarine. I'm trying to be, um, trying to be conservative with my paints, but if you wanna know how I do the marbleization effect, this is essentially how much paint I will pick up. Um, and really just pile on. So I'm just gonna just show you how I would maybe just put on something like that. And that is how I will some layer on the paint sometimes. And I don't know if you can see, but because <clears throat> it has a little bit of a wet glare, but you can see how that starts to get really nice and juicy and thick. <clears throat> Any questions so far? I'm just gonna pull out my cobalt. Pull out my cobalt. This is gonna be my cooler blue. So I just I just squeeze a little bit of cobalt. Hello, Tiffany on Facebook. Uh, you have lots of people watching from all around the world. Oh, that's and, awesome. Uh, I can't they're uh, really enjoying uh, what you're doing. So keep going. I shall. Thanks, Gabriel. So much of painting is like literally letting yourself talk to the painting. Um, you see that thick stroke I just put on there. And it's about like, I like to say it's about finding that dialogue with your painting and, you know, not fight with it, but to ask it what it needs. I sound like a yoga instructor, I know. Um, <laughs> but it's so true. And I find that with like, not just painting, but all aspects of life. So you can see how I'm holding on the brush. And I should probably step back. Stepping back is so important. Um, just, I want to just, ooh, that's a little bit, sorry. That was the wrong value. Value, 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 value. If I have the wrong value, it's just not going to work. So that was a little bit too dark. Uh, the yellow, the yellow ochre I put there. So. I need to just, I need to just mix it. Now that's a little bit too light. Actually, you can't really see because there's a glare. So I'm gonna try to hold it up and see if you can even see that. Um, and just, now there, there, there might need to be a time where you need to let some of the paint dry. So I'm probably gonna end up doing that pretty soon. Once I just solidify some of the darker values around here. My God, I need to step back and I need more. I'm gonna push some of this stuff aside because I, I like to use big gestural strokes right now. I, I, I don't wanna hit my palette. So I'm trying to keep it within the frame. Still using the flat brush for now. You guys can hear me all okay, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so I reckon my stones are a little bit too warm. Like here, I think I could probably push the cools up top a little bit more because basically the skylight is hitting the tops of those rocks. Sorry about the glare. And then I'm just gonna catch a little bit of that bounce light on the bottom. So I'm just gonna I'm going to keep it at that for now. I want to try to cover the whole the whole painting. That's what I'm most preoccupied about. So I can compare my value relationships. I'm just going to find 
a new area. I think buff titanium will be really nice for this. So I'm mixing lavender buff titanium and maybe a teeny bit of canacrinone, but that, that is a little bit strong. So now I have to, I really have to find that gray. So I'm trying to think maybe a little bit of yellow. And I don't know if you can see how delicately I am like tipping my brush like, like that. Um, it's barely, I'm barely tipping my brush in because I don't want my paint to be, my brush to be too oversaturated with water. So I'm just gonna test out the value and put it right here. You can see how dry that is because you can, oopsie, because you can see, you can see when I dry brush, it's, um, it's leaving, you know, that texture. And I, I personally in gouache, that's the kind of texture that I really like. So I will, people ask me if I, God, I'm getting a lot of paint. Sometimes when you don't mix thoroughly enough, you get some value that you don't want. Um, people ask me if I start off like, what is it, lean to thick? I usually just go straight from the get-go to dry brushing. Um, and I don't usually start off with the value study because I can pretty much see when the values aren't working, hopefully right away. and hopefully fix them, although that's not always the case. So I'm just gonna start blocking in some, some notes here. Uh, what I really wanna do is start just a hint of yellow ochre. And you can see how, hopefully you can see how delicately I'm tapping into my paints. Like it's literally just the corner because just even too much, especially with colors like pyrrole red, which is a really strong red, it can definitely just uh, shift the color over to maybe too warm or too cool uh, very fast. So um, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to like be really strategic and like leave parts of the, you guys can see the reference, like leave parts of the tone so that it feels like lights hitting it, but I've never been really good at leaving my whites like watercolor, so we'll see how that is. Um, there's some beautiful bounce light going on like really subtle and now there will probably be stuff that I hit later on, but I just hit a little bit of yellow ochre. Yeah, move away palette. Tiffany, in yeah. Facebook, we're not seeing the reference photo on the main screen very well. And in Facebook, we've asked, had a couple of requests to see it. Would it be possible for you to show us the reference photo again, just on the main live screen? Thank you. Oh, I don't know if I can, I can't, um, I was able to call it up in the chat and then uh, click on it and dragged it up to the top left of my screen. So I have it up and showing. If, if someone who's, yeah, if someone who's manning Facebook, are they able to um, download actually, the reference um, and then post it to Facebook? No, in the, I'm afraid in the Facebook uh, chat box, you cannot um, send attachments. So don't oh, worry. That's annoying. It doesn't matter. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, I don't know how well you can see this, but yeah, because you can see my ring light. Sorry. That's what I'm going off of. I'm really uh, sorry. This is um not no, the that's best. Good but... enough. That's good enough. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I'm sorry that I know it's frustrating when I think um, what we could do is when we post the final painting, we could put the uh reference with it maybe. Yeah, and then see how how bad my painting. <laughs> um, yeah, we can do that. Okay, so let's see. I'm. Hi, Stephanie. See, this is Rajat it. here. Uh, just one thing: Do you agree? Like while using this particular medium called gouache, it's an added advantage if you do a little bit of mistake, so one can patch up, isn't it? Do you agree with? Oh me? yeah, oh yeah. I definitely am not. I think making mistakes is great so you can, you know, learn how to fix it does, them. It does. I've never had a perfect ever painting flow. Like it's never been like, oh my God, this is flowing just the way I want it to. So it's been like, right. it's going great. And then the block, I really like the loose block in stage. And then it's like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And then the rest of the time is me trying to problem solve. Yeah. <laughs> and once you get used to that enough time, it's like, I know I can do this eventually. It might just take me a little bit more time, but no, you're absolutely right. I think the biggest, um, I'm gonna switch to my round brush. 
Uh, where's my round brush? I think the biggest thing that people can can do is make mistakes. Uh, the best thing people can do because that means In you're stepping out of your comfort zone, you're trying new things, and you always will learn you know, something valuable, even if it's like a technique or something about yourself inwardly, or, you know, something about, um, you know, a better way to tackle, you know, something, uh, I guess, what do you call it? Like foundational, like, oh, about values or about color and color mixing. So if you, if you allow yourself to, you know, let yourself make mistakes and see those, I think it's always the best thing. So yeah, I, Fully agree. I'm trying to figure out how to even paint these trees because <laughs> um, they're quite, I guess, abstracty. So um, Tiffany, so you're currently painting on uh, what type of paper? Uh, Gabriel, you cut off for a second. Gabriel. What kind of paper are you painting on? Can Gabriel? Well, yes. I didn't even hear the rest of your question, but what I think you're paper? asking what I'm currently painting on. And I'm currently painting on, uh, oh, here. It's it's just a fluid watercolor paper. Um, it's not like. I think she's got intermittent connection problem. Yeah. You guys, you guys. Okay, you're back. Let me put. Oh, there you go. You're back. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know why it just kind of just seems out. Um, yeah, I'm painting on fluid cold press watercolor paper. It's just random pads that I have. Um, this is a 300 gram paper. Yeah, yeah. And then what do you choose to paint on like the arches illustration board or whatever you use? Yeah, for illustration board, I'll bring that to me um, when I paint bigger paintings and um, like to painting competitions and stuff. So I'll cut up my own, like, like here, these are all on illustration board. So I cut up, it's like one eight inch thick and cold press. Um, so these are what I'll use what I use to paint and these are all been varnished as well. Um, but I alternate, it's like when I, when I think I'm just gonna be, I don't know, like practicing, I'll, I'll use watercolor paper. And then when I want something a little bit more thick, I'll, I'll go to a cold press illustration, cold press illustration board. Do you ever okay. paint on smooth surfaces? Um, I've, I actually was painting on a hot press. I. I like more toothy surfaces personally, just cause I can, I can, uh, I, I guess I like that texture, but I can't say I've really painted on super smooth surfaces. No, so maybe I should try that out. Do you have any recommendations? Um, I currently have been having fun with using some watercolor ground on some illustration board. I just happen to have some hot press illustration board that was lying around but I wanted a tooth on it so I put yeah the watercolor ground on it to have texture uh and then use the um the gouache oh that's really cool I'll have to try that watercolor ground okay I was telling them earlier I think before you joined in to get tooth I was I was, uh, I had vine charcoal and I just like grabbed a bunch of charcoal and rubbed it in paint. And then I was like drawing, painting with it. And some of the vine would be uh, left in the, in the charcoal or some, yeah, would be left in the paint and it gave it a little bit of a tooth, but your way is probably way better. So I'm gonna have to try that. Um, most, let's see, I'm in. Most people uh, that watch uh, this demos, they paint with watercolor. And they're probably looking at your water and they're wondering if you probably changed out your water or not. Uh, That's a great question. Yeah, I'll probably change it out soon, but to be honest, sometimes I forget to. Um, and I, I will when I, when I, when I'm like, 
I don't know, I guess it's intuitive. Like sometimes I'll be like, oh, okay, definitely water needs to be changed out. Well, it start, I start to notice it when I'm picking it and it starts to affect uh, like my colors, but you can see right now, I'm still able to get pretty pure color and I'm just blocking in the sky right now, which is something I always forget to do. And it's very important, obviously, because it influences the rest of your values and I'm making the sky too dark right now. So. Um, just trying to leave a little bit of that tone. Yeah, I know the color is so dirty. <laughs> her, her water is so dirty right now. I know you guys use like, I actually have a really big uh, water tub that I got, but I also almost never use it because I think, I can't remember who told me, but they said the bigger the water tub you have, the less you need to change it because I guess the water gets diluted more. Um, okay, so let's see. It seems so like with gouache, it's a little more forgiving to have dirtier water because it it's more of a matte finish paint. Yes, that's that's exactly it. Um, I think I'm gonna run out of white pretty soon, which might be a problem. So I'm gonna try to squeeze as much as I can. This is titanium white right here. Maybe this is why I need to learn how to paint thinner. Do you have um, okay. a feeling for how many glazes or layers you can control or what do you remove paint if you get too much built up that you want to correct? Um, you can remove paint by, um, here, let me see if I can demo it. You can't fully remove it, but you can put water back on like this and start lifting paint up. So sometimes when I'm like, ah, I don't like something, I'll literally take my, see how I just lifted it up there? Oh, actually I'm gonna do that. Here, I'll just, I'll just demo. Um, sometimes when I don't like something, I'll spray it like this and I'm not careful. I, because I think one of the things is like being too precious about your painting sometimes can prevent you from just, I don't know, making better choices. So you can see here, I'm just lifting up a little bit. Actually, that's kind of cool. I like that transparency. It kind of gives a nice glow. <laughs> see, I figured out something new. Um, this is what I'll do a lot when I'm when I'm stuck on a problem. Like when I literally don't like, I've done it before. I've like sprayed half a painting, let it drip, walk away, and then come back and be like, oh, okay, I see what I can do now. Um, and that's that's, and I'm sure you can do that with watercolor in a way. Um, and and I guess the equivalent. See, I don't like that greeny patch though. That didn't. That was like residue from my previous stroke. So I know I need to kind of cover that up a little bit. Um, but yeah, you can lift colors up like that. Do not like that stroke there. So that's an example of that. And then you can see the different textures from here, which is more transparent to more dry brushing here. Um, this is, this would be like very, very more rough block in stage where it's now it's like, okay, I need to now start figuring out how to refine my, um, how to refine my, my shapes a little bit more and really start thinking about, so I'm gonna actually try lavender with stereo uh, cobalt blue and buff titanium and a little bit of wisteria. And hopefully this is dry right here. I'm just gonna start using like a smaller brush and you can see how I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start to start poking into my rock shapes. I like to say like, it's kind of like sky holes, but now you're painting your rock shape. Tiffany, so we had a yeah. question on Facebook yeah. from Sarah and she was asking uh, about your color choice and palette. And she was wondering if the yellow in your mixing palette affects your other color choices in the, your palette, how with the color theory, the influence. Thank you. Just the yellow? She's commenting that the background layer of your palette is a bright yellow. Oh, and that yeah, yeah, affects yeah, your yeah, perception yeah. of color. Thank okay, you. I get that question. Um, no, I don't think it does, but maybe it's just because I'm immune to it. Um, and I also paint so thickly, like it, I don't know, maybe it does and I'm not aware of it, but um, I don't think so. And that people have asked me that question. I, when I go out and paint, I use my friend's Peshade box and he tinted my my glass like a like a really dark gray and it was so funny because I ended up literally covering the whole palette 
And he's like, I didn't even need to tint that for you. Like you just end up painting so thick. <laughs> um, this was at La Papa. So um, I don't think so, but if you think it would, then you, you don't have to use a sponge. I mean, I have like, I have this tray right here that I could use that's white. I use this usually for like demos, but I wanted to paint on something and show you guys what I really paint on. Um, so you can use that as well. I think that was like a watercolor tray I got. So I don't usually go with a smaller <clears> brush, <throat> but I'm just, I'm just gonna show you how I would start. The thing with smaller brushes with me is like, I instantly start to feel like I'm focusing too much on the, when I'm not at the right stage yet, I start to feel like I'm focusing too much on the little things, but I'm just going to see if I can, I don't like these shapes that are going on here at all. So here, I'll show you what I do. So if I don't like the shapes, we need to start big again. It's about going big and figuring out those bigger shapes and then going back and finding that, uh, finding those smaller shapes within those bigger masses. So I'm just going to do some grouping. Like those are such ugly shapes. I'm trying to lead my eye in. There is a link now in the Facebook comments. Uh, thank you to Dawn uh, for uh, uploading a link to that reference photo. Oh, awesome. So I knew this part would be the hardest. So I'm going to just focus a little bit more on my shapes. The thing that's hard with rocks is that I think as humans, we tend to create, put down shapes that are the same. So if I don't watch myself, I'm gonna put down like pebble-like shapes everywhere. It's just like, I, I noticed that about myself. So it's like here, what I'm noticing is that I'm gonna try to vary these shapes here Sorry, the teacher side is coming out of me, so I can't help but talk about this stuff, talk about composition, but it's like how I can make these shapes more interesting by poking back into it with um, some snow, some snow shapes, some lighter snow shapes. So that's kind of what is going through my mind a lot of the time when I'm when I'm painting. It's about finding that balance uh, between between your shapes and the values of your shapes. But I will start probably start adding too many small shapes if I don't watch myself. So um, and Tiffany, I always do you, step back. Do you use any varnish or any sealer after you've finished? Your work? Yeah, I use, I've been lately using a, um, uh, was it Krypton, like uh, gloss varnish, it's a spray on. Before that I was using a cold wax, um, but the spray on I like better because it's quicker and it dries a lot faster and actually darkens the values into a really nice, rich, um, like it gives the painting a little bit more richness, which I really like. So um, I've been using that more recently, but I used to use Dorland's cold wax or um, I think Gamble, I think they, so, but now I just like the spray on, so. Uh, and I don't put my paintings behind glass, which is why it's important to, for me, at least, it's important to um, make sure my paintings are protected so water doesn't get on them. Keep talking to me, so I'm distracted. <laughs> Anyone can ask questions. If you use a clear bucket for your water, then you can really see how, th how thick the water is when instead of just saying, well, it's kind of mucky on top, which we've all done, but you can see. Oh, I know. Right I know, much... it's, a, it's, it's very blue and gray right now. So I don't think I need to clean it yet though. Let's see how long no, I can go. No, when you bring it up to the light like that, we can really sort of see down um, and the stuff is down at the bottom, right? Yeah, see? Yeah. Oh, shoot, I just, um, I just poured it on my painting. Oopsie, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. See, that was easy, easy-ish fix. Gotta add some raw. Oopsie. Add some what size do you hand. usually paint on plein air? Uh, anywhere from two to two to I think the biggest I've done is eleven by fourteen. But I, but that was for a competition. Like I wouldn't really go out and 
do that myself. Um, it, it, when I'm by myself, it'll be something like, I think this is a very comfortable size. This is like three by six. Um, and then six by six is the other size I'll go with. That's a nice sort of uh, square size. I need to figure out what's going on right here. So I'm gonna mix a little bit of um, green. Now I don't usually like to, where's my round brush? This, this would be like too much of a, a green green to me. So in order to desaturate that a little bit, I'm gonna bring back some earth colors. So, um, just gonna try to add a little bit of those colors in the back there. So it feels like a little bit of light is hitting it. You can see that I'm avoiding this back part because I have to figure out how I'm gonna overlap uh, some of my shapes. But great questions, guys. People wanna know if you paint on wood panels with gouache. Yes, I have, yeah. I, I got these, uh, really cheap uh, on Amazon because I saw my friend did it and she was like selling these little like two by three or is it two by three or two by four? I forgot postcard sizes. And I was like, I want to try that. So I got like some craft board on Amazon. I didn't even just do it. So I probably should have. Oh, crap. Okay, hold on. Battery's exhausted. I need to. Sorry, guys. I need to change the battery. Um, hopefully this will work. Battery exhausted. What time is it in Germany, John? It is twenty thirty-three. Oh, it's already eleven thirty. So I can I can start uh, wrapping up, but. Oh, uh, I forgot what I was doing. Oh yeah, I still have to. This at least would be the uh, the block in stage that I would get into before I start, uh, I guess, refining my shapes even more. Sorry, can I get a little bit further into the painting? Um, but there's still like a lot of things. I hate that part, God. I need to somehow fix these little jaggedy shapes right here. Uh, talking out loud here, but yeah, this is when I start some fun, I'll just try to do some fun stuff really quick, but some fun stuff you can start doing is like, I, I could mix white and lemon yellow, which is the closest thing I'll probably get to, to, to like, to white. You can see how the Hansa yellow deep is a, a little bit too strong. So lemon, sorry, not lemon yellow, but Hansa yellow light, that, that is like a nice, it will give you a nice off tint of white, that's not exactly white. So you can see I'm mixing it in the top corner here. And what I'm going to try to do is just try to dry brush some of that lighter area in the snow. Um, now that might be actually too cool. So maybe I'll just paint a little bit of pyrrole red. And I don't know if this will work, but I'm just going to try it out. Just a little bit of yellow. So. I don't paint a lot of snow because I'm in California, but one thing I've noticed is that snow is not white. It's like every color, but white. Um, so when I'm painting snow, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be mindful of like, the, I need to make those shapes a little bit more interesting, but I can even push it probably a little bit more. And what I really like to do is like start even dry brushing areas of light in some of the rocks here and start breaking up some of those, um, those those shapes here right so it looks like just you get that really delicate rim light and I don't do this a lot but sometimes I'll take out a really small brush and I know on social media I'm all about the big brushes and this and that but there is a merit to small brushes and you really want to get into really delicate rim light so um I'll just show you really quick how I would tackle something like this um, and, and this, I probably wouldn't whip out these brushes until like later on when I'm in a, you know, more finesse stage, but for now it might be just fun to just start pulling out some of those 
more delicately light shape. So it's very, very subtle. What's what I have to do here is actually just it looks like see right here, it looks like there's light. So I actually need to just fill in some of those areas right here. So it looks like that shape is being blended in and so many other things. But these this these brushes can be a great way to imply tree trunks as well. So if I just wanted to imply like tree trunk, I could I could do that. The trees need a lot more work. I need to figure out how to paint those, but that's how I would use some of the smaller brushes and then build my way up into, um, you can still actually see I have some of the, the um, actually this would be a good area to demonstrate. One last thing, sorry, John, I know I'm over. So just let me know if I need to stop. Um, and then here, I'm just going to see if I can cover some of that those pen marks. But sometimes what I find is that even if I'm covering some of the pen marks, it's still nice to just show show a little bit of it. Um, I don't know, I kind of like that raw feeling of some of your sketching is showing a little bit. So just gonna make a little bit of pyrrole red, Hansa yellow light, maybe a little bit of lemon yellow deep and start just getting, see what happens when it's too warm though, when it's too warm, it's a, it's kind of co coming too forward. So I need to be very, very careful. So I'll probably just use Hansa yellow light just to add a little bit of accent, but I'm just showing how I cover some of those pen marks up top and really get those nice, nice little rim lights going on in the distance. I think maybe I can push it a little bit brighter and it's about incrementally nudging your color. I like to slowly push forward and, you know, not be just to see like, because it can very quickly become too much. So. Stephanie. Could, awesome. could you yeah. please, could, could you, you uh, say more about rim lights, rim lights? So, uh, can you repeat that question, please? Could you say more what you mean about rim lights? Oh yeah, so I mean by, and if you can see in the reference picture, like how the light is coming from the top right and kind of coming here, like these would be those um, rim, uh, just those subtle, those subtle hits of light that are coming in. That's what I'm trying to quickly, uh, quickly paint right now. So. I like using smaller brushes to really delicately bring out. I'm trying to see if I have an example here. Um, so for example, in this painting, like those are big examples of like really delicate rim light. That's kind of what I'm trying to mimic uh, in this so, painting. So Tiffany, will you post the finished artwork? Yes, I will definitely. Now I have a new painting to do, which is exciting and I'll post the finished thing, so. That'd be awesome. Thank yeah. you so much for your time today. You answered so many questions. I know sometimes it's uh, you really want to be able to answer the question. Um, there's just the so many time. of them. <laughs> yeah, I paint the same yeah. time. Can I ask so, one I, last one? <laughs> yeah, sure. I wonder how you got the effects on the tree, that white effect. Uh, the, the white effect is just me not finishing the tree. <laughs> I think uh, it's just uh, me dry brushing. I and, thought maybe it was um, quite dry brush when you finish the project, maybe or something like that. It was it. It's um. It's a dry brush. It's it's, okay. it's too much white right now. Like I'm I'm looking at it. I would probably because what happens when you leave too much white? It just starts looking like something's glowing. But then it can also be a cheat to show the mountain behind, and there is lighter areas in the mountain behind. So yeah. um, I'm I'm not finished with the trees. Like I could go in the trees and work on it a little bit more. But awesome! Thank you, you guys so have much. to see my block in. Yeah. Well, we awesome <laughs> to see the finished work, Tiffany. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was it was great, yeah. and thank you everybody for joining. Absolutely. Thank you, yeah, great thank job. you so much. Oh, okay. you. can I say a last Tiffany. plug? Oh, Sorry, can sure. I say a last yes. plug? Really yes. Quick? Yes. I I do have a workshop coming up in July in Spain. So if you guys are interested in joining me in Seville, Spain, I will be at the gouache workshop and I'll actually also be showing how I use 
digital painting techniques as I also am a, a digital painting artist to, um, you know, work on my reference photos or even, um, you know, enhance my gouache paintings and then go back and know what to fix in my gouache paintings. So if you guys are interested, it's on my website, tiffanymang.com and signups are open now. So I hope you guys, wherever you guys are all around the world, I hope you guys can join me in Spain and it's just July. So yeah, awesome. yes, we have the Thank LinkedIn you. workshops in Thank the you. cast. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.